you would like to pull out your bulletin or in, in your bulletins a handout for today, it's called Mary, the Mother of Our Lord. For those again watching online, this can be downloaded from the link that you, uh, if you gotten to the link from our Facebook pages, whether it's the Holy Trinity Facebook page or the Revolution Facebook page, this is connected there at the top of the page, and you're welcome to download the, the uh, handout and follow along with us if you would like. And today's lesson, as I mentioned to you, is entitled, Mary, Mother of the Lord. What an appropriate lesson, considering the fact that this is a couple of days before Christmas, and of all people who had to prepare herself for the birth of Jesus, it was Mary and Joseph. And so I want to read to you something that actually happened months and months before Jesus was born. It's what we ultimately call the Magnificat. It's that hymn of praise that Mary gives at the uh, and, uh, 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 and when she uh, is in the presence of her cousin Elizabeth and understands for the first time really what this gift of the Messiah, the gift of Jesus, is going to mean to her. So look at this uh, in Luke chapter 1, verse 39. At the time, Mary got ready and hurried to a town in a hill country of Judea. This was after it was revealed to her by the angel that she would give birth to a son, and he would be the salvation of the world. She went and fled and went to be with her cousin, Elizabeth. And so where she entered Zachariah's home, and she greeted Elizabeth. Now, she may not have received news that her cousin was pregnant. Needless to say, it might have been a bit of a shock to her to know that this old woman who was barren and for all of her life wanted children, was never able to have them, now all of a sudden was giving birth to a child. If nothing indicated to Mary that there was something really unusual going on, this certainly is. Well, outside of a visit by the angel, that would be an unusual thing. So this would certainly be an indication too that God was doing something spectacular. Now when Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, listen to this, the baby within her womb leapt we're talking about John the Baptist. And Elizabeth was filled with the gift of the Holy Spirit. And in a loud voice she exclaimed, Now wait, I want you to think about this because I'm not preaching on this. Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. Does anybody see something odd about that and spectacular? Think about this for a minute. In the Old Testament, who was blessed with the gift of the Holy Spirit? Religious leaders, prophets, judges, judges. There might be a woman, maybe Deborah. I'm not even sure. I don't think the Bible even mentions her being filled with the Spirit. This is likely the very first woman in the Bible where it says very specifically she was filled with the Holy Spirit. God is putting an exclamation point on the fact that women are the equal of men, first of all. But in addition to that, is also making a statement that something spectacular is going on here. And God is going to work God's miraculous things despite the bigotries of men. I love this. So she's filled with the Holy Spirit. This is a spectacular thing. And I guarantee you that any Jew reading this, that Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit, was saying, Huh? A woman? Yeah, a woman. That's right. In a loud voice, she exclaimed, Blessed are you among women. She said this to Mary, her cousin. Blessed is the child that you will bear. How did she know she was going to have a child? Again, that was revealed to her through the gift of the Spirit. But why am I so favored that the mother of my Lord should come to me? Oh my goodness, do you hear this? Elizabeth is giving birth to a baby. And she's more in awe that Mary, her cousin, has come to visit because she represents the gift of God. Now, as soon as the sound of your, the greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leapt for joy, and blessed is she who has believed that the Lord would fulfill his promise to her. That's important, that verse 45, because Mary accepted the announcement of the angel and just said, okay, whatever you would like, what, according to the Lord's favor. Mary went on to say, this is a beautiful hymn, we call it the Magnificat. My soul glorifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he has been mindful of the humble state of his servants. From now on, all generations will call me blessed, for the Mighty One has done great things for me. His holy, he holy is his name. His mercy extends to those who fear <coughs> from generation to generation. 
He has performed mighty deeds with his arms. He has scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. He has brought down rulers from their homes and lifted up the humble. For he has filled the hungry with good things, but sent the rich away empty. Boy, isn't that a good vision. He has helped to serve in Israel, remembering to be merciful to Abraham and his descendants forever, just as he promised our ancestor. Wow, what a powerful lesson this is today. It is a reminder that God takes broken things, weak things, things that everybody has cast off and thinks are worthless, and finds that they are the greatest gems of all. And I hope this is a reminder to those of you sitting here today who do not feel, you notice there's a theme here today, right? Those who feel like you are cast off, those who feel less than, those who feel like there's no one in this world who could possibly love you, I'm here to tell you today that those are the very things that God loves the most. God loves the land of misfit toys. You remember Rudolph? Right? One of my favorite Christmas things is Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. Yeah. And the island of misfit toys, the cast off that nobody wants, becomes the gem in the kingdom of heaven. That's what God does. If you are feeling like you're cast off, like you're less than, you're in good company because Mary, the mother of our Lord, was a cast off, somebody that nobody wanted, and yet she became the mother of our Lord. And so I'm here to celebrate this wonderful woman today and to celebrate the gift of Jesus that she blessed, with whom she blessed the world. Now I want to tell you this. Because we often in these Protestant churches and in our Lutheran churches, I don't believe have enough esteem for Mary. See, we look at our brothers and sisters in the Catholic Church, and we say, well, we don't revere and honor Mary that way, and I'm just like, why not? What's wrong with that? I think our Roman Catholic brothers and sisters have it right. We should have a greater respect for Mary than what we do. Her name should be on our lips on a regular basis and give thanks for the gift that she gave us. You want to know why I'm saying this? Because the Bible tells us so. I thought that was good enough for a lot of us conservative Christians. Well, the Bible tells me so, therefore I believe it. Well, the Bible tells us that we should honor and revere Mary. And if you're one of those that's anti-Catholic or anti-Mary as a result and says, well, I'm not anti-Mary, I just don't do what the Catholics do with Mary because that's silly. Maybe you should stop and learn from our Roman Catholic brothers and sisters. The honor and the reverence that they have for Mary is a great thing. And we should have it too. Why? For those of us who are conservative Christians like me, because the Bible tells me so. She was a great woman deserving of honor and respect. And I'm going to prove it to you in just a moment. Take a look at, the, uh, at our lesson for today. Mary represents the life-giving, life-nurturing love of God. In the early church, she was called Theodicus. That's a Greek word that means God-bearer. When we translate that into English, we often translate that as mother of God. I think that's a great moniker for Mary to carry because that's truly what she was. She bore the child uh, she bore the child that was to be the salvation of the world, the gift of God, the gift of God's love, the gift of God's salvation. Now, there are a lot of loving babies born in this world every day. There's a lot of people to hope. There's a lot of people that bring the love of God to us. But Jesus doesn't just bring us the love of God. He is the love of God. And Mary was the one who was privileged with carrying him or tasks. I'm not sure how much of, I guess it was a privilege, but she led a very difficult life as a result of this choice. Now, why should we celebrate and honor Mary? I told you, the Bible tells us so. I'm going to tell you why. Because Mary, we celebrate the loving and nurturing nature of God as seen through the choice of Mary to carry this child, Jesus. And the New Testament is very clear to us in the book of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Every single major event in Jesus' life, guess who was there? Oh, tell me, please. Mary. Mary, okay? Mary was present at every single significant event in Jesus' life. Now, the very first things you'd say, like, well, duh. Okay, she was there. We, we see her at the betrothal to Joseph before she was married. 
We see her at the Annunciation when Gabriel, the angel, came and told her, oh, you're going to have a baby. And oh, by the way, before you get married, and oh, by the way, before you have marital relationships with this guy, Joseph, you're going to have a baby. And she's like, okay, whatever you say. Seems like a spectacular, crazy thing to me, but I'm on page with it. That's what Mary says. Okay, that's my interpretation. At her visitation that we just read today with Elizabeth, the mother of John the Baptist, where once again it was emphasized to her how important this baby would be. At the nativity of her Lord, well, I guess if she's the mother of her Lord, she's got to be there at his birth too, right? That's kind of important, unless she had some really good drugs. And then maybe she's absent, at least in mind, if not in body. The visitation by the shepherds and the angel. The presentation of the infant baby Jesus in the temple at the age of 40 days. And then you might, might remember there's a madman by the name of Herod the Great who decided that he was going to kill all the babies in Bethlehem because he was afraid that one of them was going to grow up to be the ruler of Israel. And so in his madness, he killed all the babies under the age of two. And Jesus' parents... Joseph and Mary were warned in a dream, and so they fled and went to Egypt for a short time until Herod the Great was where the Great died. And then, of course, they came back, and not, of course, to Bethlehem, but they went to Nazareth. And they were there, there. We see another story of Jesus at the temple when Jesus was 12 at the Passover. We see Jesus and his very first miracle. What happened? He was at a wedding in Cana in Galilee. And there was something about the alcohol running dry. That would be a bad thing. Those are, are the closest to our newlyweds here. That would be a bad thing, right? You're there and all of a sudden everybody comes up and he says, Fill the, All the liquor's gone. What are we going to do? And so they come up to Mary and they say, Mary, you better tell your son to do something. So Mary goes and pleads with her son. Honey, the liquor's gone. What are we going to do? He said, give me some water. This is no big deal. And he turns that water into wine. He performs the very first miracle at the request of his mother, Mary. Now, if I'd asked it, I'm not sure he would have done that. If you'd asked it, I'm not sure he would have done that. But because his mother, Mary, asked him, how could he deny those doughy eyes of his mother, Mary, right? When your mom asks you to do something, you do it. Right, Crystal? Right. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Right? Right? Yeah. No, in your case, maybe not. Maybe John. Right, John? Hey. Yeah. Maybe, maybe your, maybe your, your, your stepmother more likely. <laughs> That's right. All righty. Where were we? I have no clue. Oh, she was there at the occasion when observers said of Jesus, "How can this man be so special? We know his family after all." Wouldn't that be a hurtful thing if somebody said that about your kid when you're standing there? She was there for those hurtful words that were said of Jesus, so she was probably there to comfort him in his time of need. I think that was significant. She was there on the occasion when he was preaching and, and healing. She, she was present at the foot of the cross when her baby boy was hanging there dying. Who could do that? Well, obviously, a mom could. Because she wanted to give him comfort in this time of death. She was there at the resurrection. She was there at the presence of the apostles in the upper room after the ascension, waiting for the promise of, promise of the Holy Spirit. Therefore, my point is simply this. There is a reason why Mary has mentioned every significant event in Jesus' life because the Bible is trying to tell us she is important. And you better take note because she's a true example of what a disciple of God is is about. We mention her, I don't know, do you, are you aware, maybe not in this service, but in our church every single Sunday, we do mention Mary's name every single Sunday. Did you know that? In the Creed. In the Creed. Thank you. The Nicene Creed and the Apostles' Creed both mention the name of Mary. Outside of Jesus, there's only one other person's name that's mentioned in the Creed. Who is it? Point of trivia. P.P. Pontius Pilate is the other person that's mentioned. PP, yeah. Okay. It's a little bathroom humor here, I guess. Pontius Pilate is the other one that's mentioned there. And we are told, the thing that it mentions of her is it mentions that our Lord was born by virgin birth to Mary. And 
Today, there are a lot of very liberal scholars. A lot of, well, <laughs> I hate to say it, probably 80% of our Lutheran pastors don't believe that Mary would have been a virgin because that's just kind of an absurdity. I mean, after all, science proves that you can't be a, a virgin and give birth to a child, and to which I just say, you guys are idiots. Don't you know the God that we serve? Don't you believe that God is miraculous and does spectacular things? To me, it's just an amazing thing that we make such a big deal out of science. And I love science, and you guys who know me know I'm really big on science. And I'm really big on trying to discover things. And I'm really big sometimes, I do think the Bible presents some things in a manner that we realize, oh, these are very scientific things. But this is a spectacular, miraculous thing. But what the liberal scholars will tell us is they'll say, well, you know, there's really not a word in Hebrew for virgin. And they would be correct. The word that we translate as virgin, actually literally translated, would be translated as young woman. And they say, well, she was just a young woman, and she probably, this, this is where they're coming, well, she probably just had sex out of wedlock with Joseph. Wouldn't be the first one. The unwed, first unwed mother having a birth out of wedlock with her betrothed Joseph. That's not what the Bible says, though. If that's what had happened, it still would not have used the word that we translate virgin or young woman of Mary. Because young woman, the, the word that's translated, that we translate as virgin, is a very specific word. It's a word that refers to a 13, 14 year old girl before she has had marital relationships, but who is ready to be married. So that she is a virgin is implied by the word. There may not be a word for virgin, but it is implied by the fact that the Bible uses this word of her that she has not been in relationship physically with this man Joseph. And the Bible very specifically says of her that she is not to have any relationship with Joseph until after she is married. So why am I making such a big deal of this? First of all, because I believe in miracles. I believe there's spectacular things that happen. But I also think because the Bible is trying to make a point for why she was a virgin at the birth of Jesus. And it's a theological point that we make whenever we confess in our creeds. And it's simply this. Remember that spirit that I mentioned to you? The spirit was active in the creation of this world when the man of dust, Adam, that's what the word Adam means, by the way, and the woman, Eve, that's what the word Eve means, the man of dust and Eve were created. In fact, what does the Bible say? The Bible says that the spirit moved and blowed its life into the lungs of this man and this woman. So the spirit was present in creation, giving life. The next time the Spirit is active in some type of act of creation is when? In Mary. The birth of our new life as represented by Jesus. So the Spirit was active in the birth of the first man, Adam. The Spirit was active in the birth of the new man, Jesus, who would become the life for all of us. So God, once again, is doing something brand new. So in the virgin birth, the Spirit is again present, doing this spectacular and unexpected thing. And so that's what's being stated by that. So, you know, the Bible says that I believe it, deal with it. If you're a conservative Christian, maybe you need to hold up Mary to a little higher esteem, because she was a spectacular woman. And I'm going to tell you why. Look at number three. This is what I believe that we learned from Mary today. The first thing I love about Mary is that she always points to Jesus. So she always says, here's my son, listen to him, do what he has to say. And so our regard for Mary, when you're looking, if you're looking for Jesus, you, you can find Jesus in Mary. Look to Mary and she'll point to her son. There's a good Jewish joke about sons and daughters there. I don't know what it is. I'm a bad joke teller anyway, so it's best just to leave it there. But there's got to be something about looking at a good Jewish mom and seeing her son, because they always point to their sons. But this is what Mary does for us. She's always pointing to Jesus. 
And that's an example for us. If anybody comes up to you and says, Oh, man, you're such a great person. Yeah, I thank God for that. Because that's the way God made me. I'm just great. Right? God made me that way. And that's what Mary does. She's always pointing beyond herself. And so I think a right regard for Mary will always direct us to Jesus, who found in her his first earthly dwelling place. I told you I don't have a joke here, but I do have a story. There is a woman who is a member of our Catholic parish up here that closed a couple of years ago at St. Helens. She's the one that... Uh, you might know her. Is Estotian? Estotian? Janet Estotian. Janet Estotian. She, uh, I really loved her. She was a great lady. And she, uh, she just died a little while ago. And, uh, but she would always care for the gardens and take care of things and always was putzing around doing something. But she and I have had many conversations over the years that I've been here. And I'll tell you, one that really stuck out to me is we were talking about Mary. And she said to me, I know you... You Lutherans think I'm crazy, and we Catholics are crazy, but I actually pray to Mary. And I said, oh, well, tell me why. And she said, because she had lived a very difficult life. She'd seen very abusive men, and she was just not comfortable with men. It made her very uncomfortable. And so she found it very comforting that she could go and pray to God through Mary, and believed that God would hear her prayer. Because she found such solace and such comfort in such a loving, kindly figure as Mary. And she said, I'm sure you think that's crazy. And you know what I think about that? I don't think it's crazy at all. You know, we Protestants and we Lutherans got to get over our judgmentalism about our brothers and sisters in the Catholic Church. If Mary helped her to come into a deeper relationship with God, who that, excuse me, hell are you to judge? Am I right? Yes. Mm -hmm. If her prayer, if she believes that God is hearing her, God will hear that and reward that as righteousness. I am telling you, you've got to get over your judgmentalism of this. These brothers and sisters of ours in the Catholic Church are okay in my book, okay? And if a woman needs to approach God through Mary, then that's the reason why I believe that Mary is such a central and key figure in the Bible, that the Bible lifts her up. Good for her. And I believe that she is now in the care of God, and God rewarded her prayers as faithfulness. That's, that's, not, that's letter A under number three there, what I think we learn. This letter B, or what else do we learn about Mary? This is important as well. I believe that God saw something special in her that made her a worthy candidate to be the mother of Jesus. She was poor. She had nothing to her name. She had a family name that certainly dated all the way back to King David, and that was good for her. But honestly, otherwise, she was an outcast. She was a poor woman. She had nothing to her name and nothing that would designate her as being something spectacular. And yet, here's the amazing thing that she did. When the angel Gabriel came to her and said, I want you to give birth. God wants you, has chosen you to give birth to the Messiah. And you're going to do it in a spectacular fashion before you have marital relationships with man Joseph. And what was Mary's response to this? She said, okay. Whatever you want. I'm here and you're serving. Uh, do you hear how spectacular this is, this response to this woman? What did Moses do when God came up to him? Moses, this great man of the Old Testament, and God came up to him and said, I want to send you to Egypt. What did, he, what did Moses do? I don't send me, God. There's better people than me. And Moses kept saying, no, 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 no. God had to keep grinding at him and wearing him down and wearing him down. And finally Moses said, okay. Elijah, same thing. Jeremiah, oh God, I'm too young. I can't go. You can use somebody better than me. I don't want to do this. God had to keep grinding at him, grinding at him, grinding at him. Even Zechariah, the father of John the Baptist, 
You're gonna have a baby boy! Ha! Huh. Yeah, right. Sure, God. My wife is a wrinkled old prude. She's not having a baby. That isn't gonna happen. Hogwash. Okay? Okay, you're gonna act that way, Zachariah. I'm gonna strike you dumb and mute until that baby is born. Oh, how about, how about Abraham and Sarah? You're gonna have a baby boy. Sure we are. Right. Mary, you're going to have a baby boy. You're going to do it as a virgin, and it's going to be the savior of the world. He's going to die for people. Okay, whatever you ask. You tell me, who is the greatest disciple in the Bible? I'm going to tell you. You got it. Mary, mother of our Lord. Mary, the God-bearer. Mary, the mother of our Lord, Mary, the greatest disciple in the Bible, Mary, the one who always points beyond herself because she's such a humble woman, Mary, Mary, the woman who was the only worthy candidate to carry this child because she was the only one that would believe it, accept it, and do it. So you want to see a true example of faith? Don't look at me, because I'm going to fail you. Thank you for that tongue. <laughs> I just, yes, for those online, and somebody just stuck their tongue out of me. That's okay. That's right, because I'm a failure, oftentimes. But if you want to see true discipleship, let's look to Mary. And Mary ultimately will point us to Jesus. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful for this greatest disciple who also happened to be the mother of our Lord. She's always pointing beyond herself to her son Jesus. She was there for every event of his life, good and bad. She picked him up when he bruised his knees. She kissed him when he was sorrowful. She was there with him at his death. She was faithful. God, we ask you would birth that faithful spirit in us that we too might become disciples like Mary and that we too might point to Jesus. For we ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I'm asking for a